Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another true crime video and today we are continuing on with the case of Natalia Barnett, a young Ukrainian orphan who was accused by her adopted parents of being a grown woman who was also diagnosed as a sociopath who tried to kill them multiple times but yeah she never did actually kill them and her parents, her adopted parents, they never called the police and reported these multiple scary attempts on their lives, even though they claim to have lived in fear of this little girl for years. What we also know about Natalia is that she was born with several health issues, including diastrophic dysplasia, leading to a rare form of dwarfism, severe scoliosis, severe hip contractures, and a club foot. And I'm probably not going to be able to put as many clips into this video from the docu-series The Curious Case of Natalia Grace, simply because I wrestled with copyright issues on part one for literally four days, and it wasn't just about it being monetarily blocked. I don't care. At, at some point after the first day, I would have just posted it and been like, whatever. But it was just literally blocked from being seen in the United States, which as YouTube helpfully informed me, that would have been preventing 66% of my audience from seeing it. So I just don't have the mental capacity to fight any longer. <laughs> that was rough. But I will put clips in from other interviews. I'll describe what was happening in the clips that I would have played for you. And I also, I'm going to try to sneak in a couple clips that I really want you to see. I do highly encourage you, though, to watch the docuseries if you haven't, because Michael Barnett doesn't get more normal as the series progresses, if you know what I mean. It's like you wouldn't believe in an in alien race, you know, unless you saw this alien race for yourself. And you can't believe that uh, Michael Barnett is the way he is. Like, you wouldn't be able to believe that the alien race of one that is Michael Barnett exists unless you see him with your own eyes. So I, I do think you should watch it if you haven't already. And if you're interested in it, you should go ahead and watch it. But before we dive into today's video, let's have a word from the sponsor, Surfshark VPN. We know that the internet can be a fun and wonderful place we are using the internet right now to communicate with each other. We can learn things. We can meet new people. It's awesome. But it can also be a place full of dangers and unfair restrictions, as well as plenty of trickery. We need to feel safe and comfortable in order to flourish in life. And luckily, Surfshark VPN exists to help keep you protected on the internet so that you can enjoy all that the World Wide Web has to offer with an unburdened mind and an open heart. Surfshark VPN VPN secures your data with industry-leading measures by using uncrackable encryption and the most secure VPN protocols. And Surfshark also provides IP and DNS leak protection so that nobody can figure out where you're connecting from, which is one of my favorite features of Surfshark. I also love that unlike your internet service provider, Surfshark VPN has a strict no-logs policy. That means they aren't watching and recording what you're doing on the internet because you are an adult. Hopefully, if you're watching this video, you're an adult. And it's none of their business. So what can you do better on the internet with Surfshark VPN? A lot. Almost everything. You can overcome location, price-based discrimination on things like travel expenses, you know, plane tickets, rental cars, hotels. If you're traveling internationally, you can log into a server in your home country so that your bank account doesn't lock you out or freeze your account for security purposes. And if that has ever happened to you, you'll understand how much it sucks and why you want to avoid it. I also love that you can feel safe on public Wi-Fi with Surfshark VPN, which is something that you really can't say that often, especially when you're just raw dogging it out in the world without Surfshark VPN on your phone or your laptop or your devices because Surfshark encrypts your data and makes it impossible to steal. And a person doesn't have to be some like super spy to know how to crack into your devices when you're on a public Wi-Fi. And you can also quickly get around censorship and geo-blocking on the internet. So all the information you want is available, not just the information that they want you to see. On top of all of that, with Surfshark VPN, you can unlock 15 of the largest Netflix country libraries, including the US and Japan, simply by connecting to a server in that country. And at this time, Surfshark has reached the coverage of 100 countries, and they're the only VPN to do so at this point, which is pretty awesome. Surfshark also has an app for every platform, whether it's PC, Mac, Linux, Android, iOS, Smart TVs, Amazon Fire Stick, Apple TV, Chrome, Firefox, Xbox, and PlayStation. One subscription allows you to install and run Surfshark on an unlimited number of devices at once. And this really helps, too, if you're traveling internationally. Like, we always go to Canada, and the TV in the hotels in Canada is just horrendous. The TV 
VPN hotels anywhere is horrendous. There's so much value in Surfshark VPN, and they think that you'll agree as well, which is why they're giving you a 30-day money-back guarantee, which gives you plenty of time to try Surfshark for yourself risk-free. All you have to do is go to surfshark.deals slash Stephanie Harlow and use code Stephanie Harlow to get 83% off a two-year plan plus three extra months for free. This special offer makes your subscription just $2.21 a month, a literal steal. Once again, go to surfshark.deals slash Stephanie Harlow and use code Stephanie Harlow to get 83% off a two-year subscription plus three extra months for free. Thank you so much to Surfshark for sponsoring today's video and let's dive in. Okay, so in the first video, in part one, we sort of placed a foundation and we understand what the Barnetts were claiming, that Natalia was not a child. They said she was an adult and they'd somehow been duped and now they were living as prisoners of fear in their own home. And I believe that the reality of the situation was that Natalia did have some health issues and her operations and care and recovery, honestly, from those operations would be very expensive and time-consuming. I also believe the Barnetts wanted to move to Canada so they could bring their child prodigy Jacob to a school there. And I, I will admit that Natalia may have had some behavioral issues, which stemmed from a childhood filled with trauma and abandonment. And a problem child it just didn't fit in with the Barnetts' squeaky clean, perfect family image they wanted to project to the world. These are the kinds of people, in my opinion, who believe their children are a direct reflection of themselves, and they set expectations for their kids, not to benefit the child, but to make themselves, the parent, look good and feel good. But you will never convince me that Natalia was an adult in 2010 when the Barnetts adopted her. To me, this seems pretty obvious. Really does. Like, if you know anything about this case and the new information and the new evidence that's come out, you don't even have to see the docuseries. It's pretty obvious. I don't understand what's happening because I... I'm, I'm surprised to find that there are literally people out there who vehemently believe that Natalia is some adult con artist and, and they will die on that hill no matter how much proof you show them. And there's plenty of proof to be shown. I honestly am starting to believe that the people in my comment section who are saying, oh, she was definitely an adult. Um, she's a scary, like, sociopath. You'll never convince me otherwise. I'm starting to believe that those people are either the Barnetts themselves paid by the Barnetts to just be flooding the comment section of YouTube videos talking about this case or um, tr trolls. I don't know. The only other option I can think of is that you're just ignorant and lazy and you don't want to do the actual research, which you will find all the facts are available out there. All you have to do is Google it, you know. Um, so I don't understand what's happening here. <laughs> I don't because we are going to go over more proof and evidence now. And I understand in part one, like we kind of just went over what the Barnetts were claiming. And that was purposeful because I wanted to show you what they were claiming. But if you would just give me a chance, I will prove to you. I'll show you all the evidence that you need to see that Natalia was an actual young child at the time that she lived with the Barnetts and at the time that the Barnetts abandoned her in an apartment by herself. So let's look at the timeline and see how many times the Barnetts had doctors or dentists try to determine Natalia's age and what the results were of these examinations before Christine and Michael Barnett had Natalia legally aged up in 2012. So it was May of 2010 when Natalia first met the Barnetts, and at this time, Natalia would have been probably about six and a half or seven based on her September 2003 date of birth. On June 3rd, 2010, at the request of Michael and Christine Barnett, Dr. Andrew Riggs at Peyton Manning Hospital in Indiana examined Natalia and estimated her age to be around eight years old. Now that doesn't mean that she wasn't actually six and a half, it just means that doctors can't figure out an exact age through examination. On September 4th, 2010, Natalia would have been turning seven years old, and later that year she underwent surgery on her foot. On May 31st, 2011, Christine Barnett brought Natalia to Easy Dental and asked the folks there to estimate Natalia's age. An exam was done and x-rays were taken of Natalia's teeth and mouth and Christine was advised by the people at Easy Dental that Natalia was between eight and nine years of age. 
Once again, this is just an estimate. In June of 2012, Natalia was at Peyton Manning Hospital again for another complete examination at the request of Michael and Christine Barnett. A bone density test put Natalia's age at approximately 11 years old. Now, according to the Barnetts, they had initially taken Natalia to the hospital back in June of 2010 after seeing signs of puberty, but they claimed that they were told Natalia was at least 14 at that time. We know all of this from a probable cause affidavit, but we also so know that the doctor at Peyton Manning Hospital did not tell the Barnetts that Natalia was 14. He did not say that at all. He said she was between 8 and 9. Now, as far as I could find, there's only one medical professional who supported the Barnett's claims that Natalia was not a child, and that was Michael Barnett's primary care physician, Dr. Andrew McLaren, who wrote a short letter in October of 2016 claiming that he had examined Natalia on May 24, 2010, the same month the Barnett's brought her home. The letter reads as follows. I am writing on behalf of Mr. Barnett and in reference to his adopted daughter, Natalia Barnett. I know both Mr. Barnett and his ex-wife, Christine Barnett, very well. I first met Natalia on May 24, 2010 and served as her primary care doctor until at least 2012. She had previously been adopted or fostered by at least two different families out of state. The birth certificate that was given to the Barnetts showed a date of birth of 9403. This date is clearly inaccurate. Unfortunately, determination of Natalia's true age has been difficult. Records provided by officials in her native country, the Ukraine, are grossly incomplete. Also because she has dysplasia, a type of dwarfism, conventional methods of determining age are not useful. She has been seen by both an orthopedist and an endocrinologist. Neither specialist was able to help substantially with age assessment. Over time, it became incredibly apparent that this patient is substantially older than she claimed to be. She was seen by a dentist in 2011 who described her dentition as adult. A neuropsych Psychology evaluation in 2011 described her as fully grown and with secondary sex characteristics. This signifies adult sexual development. During an inpatient psychiatric hospitalization in 2012, it was stated that she was at least 14 years of age. A normal menstrual cycle was documented during that hospitalization. She was also diagnosed at that time with sociopathic personality disorder, which usually doesn't appear until at least 16 years of age. Around that time, she began admitting that she was over 18. This was about about five years ago. Miss Natalia Barnett has made a career of perpetuating her age facade. She has continued to fool those who have the best intentions. This includes previous and current caregivers, physicians, and her adoptive parents. The biggest victims here are Michael and Christine Barnett, who did everything in their power to provide Natalia with a better life. Their rewards were enormous amounts of stress and substantial financial losses. It is my understanding that Natalia is once again claiming to be a child. This behavior is counterproductive to everyone involved and will destroy disrupt the lives of those whose lives she infiltrates. It will also continue to delay appropriate medical care for this patient, end quote. Okay, so for the record, this letter, which is typed, has never been verified by any sources, so we don't actually know if Dr. McLaren wrote it, but for his sake, I hope not, because there are a lot of issues here in this letter. First, why is Michael's primary care physician acting as Natalia's primary care physician? She was a child with disabilities. Would she not be better off with a specialist and a pediatrician? Moving on, Dr. McLaren says that Natalia's date of birth is clearly inaccurate, but he never says why. This isn't a written-up medical report where he shows his work. It's a three-paragraph letter during which Dr. McLaren makes bold claims that he never provides evidence to support. Very undoctorly, if you ask me. And he continues to be undoctorally. He says that Natalia was seen by an endocrinologist and an orthopedist, and they were both unhelpful in determining her age. But we know that she saw these specialists at Peyton Manning Hospital in June of 2012, and they did give an estimated age. 11. So did Dr. McLaren just forget about that? We know he had these reports. We know that he had this documentation. As far as, you know, I'm concerned, he would have had all of her medical records being her primary care physician, right? So did he just overlook that? Or did he not believe it? Or did it not fit in with his narrative? Or did it not fit in with the narratives of the Barnetts? We're now at the part of the letter where Dr. McLaren, or whoever is pretending to be him, shows a clear and, you know, rude, I think, unprofessionalism and bias towards the Barnetts. He says the patient clearly is not the age she's claiming to be, which makes Natalia by default seem nefarious. It already gives like this con artist vibe. But once again, he doesn't prove that she's lying about her age. And might I add, 
she was just a child. She only knows what others tell her, including her age. It's not like she's walking around like, this is my age. Like, this was her idea to say this age. The good doctor goes on to speak about the few times Natalia was admitted to mental health facilities once in 2011, at which point she was deemed to be fully grown. How the hell would a neuropsychology exam be able to determine that she was fully grown? That type of test measures how well a person's brain is working. It does not determine their age. He says in 2012, Natalia was a patient at a psychiatric hospital during which time she regularly had a period and she admitted to being over 18 years of age. And she was also diagnosed with sociopathic personality disorder. First off, there's no such thing as sociopathic personality disorder. You can be diagnosed with sociopathy or antisocial personality disorder, but don't you think a doctor would know that? That there's no such thing as, what do you say, sociopathic personality disorder? That, that's not a thing. That doesn't exist. It's not a real medical term. And you honestly can't be diagnosed with either of these things as a child, so it doesn't really matter. Like, under the age of 18, no legitimate doctor who has credentials and who cares about medicine and science would actually give somebody a diagnosis of sociopathy or antisocial personality disorder. So this letter goes on to accuse Natalia of making a career out of pretending to be a child. And I would just like to know how, like how did she make a career out of it, right? A career means you're benefiting in some way. So did Natalia have a history of stealing from her caregivers? Did she murder anyone? What did she gain from this facade of childhood? Nobody ever says that. In order to commit a crime, you have to have three things, right? Um, means, motive, opportunity. What's her motive? What's her motive? Just to live in a house and then harass and torture people in the house? but never actually hurt them like physically? What's the motive here? And then Dr. McLaren, or whoever is writing this letter, goes on to say that the Barnetts are the biggest victims here, and they tried to give Natalia a good life and all that nonsense. So here's my take. Either Dr. McLaren did not write this, and Michael or Christine Barnett did, and then just said it was from the doctor, or McLaren was a close and personal friend of the Barnetts, and he wrote what they told him to write. Maybe there was some money changing hands as well. Maybe the fact that Dr. McLaren helped the Barnetts re-age Natalia in 2012 caused him to write this letter in 2016 because he wasn't just covering for the Barnetts. He was also covering for himself at that point because if he helped them you know, do something which allowed them to get away with a crime of neglect, which allowed them to basically abandon a nine-year-old child and have no responsibility for her, and Dr. McLaren helped them with that, he would be held legally responsible in some way. But this is just my speculation. Allegedly, don't come for me. I'm just spitballing here. But I will say again, Dr. McLaren is the only medical professional that Natalia saw, and I don't even know if she actually saw him, but the only one who said she was an adult. Right. So I have people in the comments from part one saying, um, didn't doctors like say she wasn't? No, dude. One idiot doctor and the rest of the doctors said she was a child. I mean, this seems pretty like cotton dry. Not a lot of things are black and white in life. This seems to be one of them. This letter also mentions two separate incidences of Natalia being treated at mental health facilities, and I have not seen proof or evidence that these events occurred, but I'll tell you what they've alleged. Reportedly, the first time Natalia was put into some mental health facility was after um, she and the Barnetts went as a family to a place called Traders Point Creamery so that they could milk their own cows for one of their son's birthdays. Michael claims that before they were allowed to go to the barn, you know, to milk the cows, the whole family had to sign a waiver to indicate that they understood there was an electrical fence on the property and that they could be harmed by this fence. So the creamery wanted everyone to sign a waiver so that if, you know, by by chance somebody got hurt on this electrical fence, they couldn't sue the creamery. Michael claims as soon as Natalia heard this, her eyes gleamed and she began to salivate. She was so excited because she wanted to kill Christine Barnett. Knowing what I know now, what happened between Christine and Michael Barnett and, you know, they would eventually get divorced, I think in 2014. But knowing the relationship between them, I kind of think Michael wanted to kill Christine Barnett and he was projecting this onto Natalia. So according to Michael, they all start walking down the path towards the place where you milk the cows, but then Natalia fell down and she pretended she couldn't walk. And Christine told Natalia to get up and Natalia was like, I can't. So everyone's waiting there and Christine tells Michael, you know, get the boys and keep going because I'm not going to let Natalia ruin my son's birthday. And Christine stayed back with Natalia to give her a good talking to. 
Not long after this, Michael claims he heard screaming and he turned around to see what looked like Natalia trying to force Christine onto the electrical fence. Michael rushed back and by the time he arrived, so had the police and an ambulance. And according to Michael, in front of the first responders, Natalia was shrieking at Christine, I'm going to kill you, bitch, before she was loaded into the ambulance and taken off to have a psychiatric consultation. First of all, the fence at Traders Point Creamery was not even electrified at this point, and some of these first responders weighed in on what they had witnessed when arriving on the scene. This guy named Chris, he worked at the creamery from 2012 to 2015, and on the day that Michael claims Natalia tried to kill Christine on the electric fence, Chris was the one who brought the police down to where the incident had happened. Chris said, quote, I was under the impression that when we got down there, there was going to be a little person who was distressed, very emotional. When we got down there, the caretaker seemed to be the emotional one of the two, and the little person seemed to be more calm and rational about the whole situation. There was no mention of the caretaker being at risk or anything like that. End quote. Chris said that he did not hear Natalia tell Christine she was going to kill her, even though that's what Michael Barnett claims, that Natalia was screaming this while, you know, the workers were there and the ambulance people were there. And Chris felt like the whole situation was overblown and it wasn't that big of a deal. He said, quote, the biggest thing I remember is thinking that if I had to deal with the adult caretaker, that I would be really frustrated just because it felt like she seemed to be making the situation worse. End quote. Chris is very astute. It does seem like Christine Barnett would make every situation she encountered much worse. We also have farm manager Mark, who's the one who lets us know in the docuseries that the electric fence wasn't even on because the cows were in a different part of the farm at that point. During the docuseries, we were introduced to a woman named Beth Karras, a New York attorney and former prosecutor who is honestly our first breath of fresh air in this series. And she basically says that if what the Barnetts staunchly claimed happened at the creamery is not true, then this cast doubt on all of their other unbelievable stories that they've told. And I think that this is a very fair statement. And we clearly see that what the Barnett's claim happened and what, you know, regular logical people who are not off their rockers claim happened are two different narratives. Now, the Barnett's would later be charged with neglect of Natalia. And in September of 2019, Natalia was interviewed by a member of the prosecution team, the team who'd be trying to prove these charges against the Barnett's. And she talked about the Traders Point Creamer incident. Natalia said, quote, we were on a trail, but I didn't have good shoes. My feet started really hurting and they were bleeding and I threw up because I didn't eat for like a while. So I threw up and it was blood and I was really dehydrated. So I sat down. She, Christine, sat down next to me on the grass because she told the boys to go ahead of us. And she was like, Natalia, you need to get up. And I was like, my feet hurt. She was like, you need to get up. So I finally got up. She helped me up. Like literally, I was down and I reached up and she helped me up and then she fell and it was kind of close. She fell and I fell and she thought I was trying to put her into the electric fence or something and she called the police, end quote. So pay attention. Natalia said she didn't have good shoes. This is not an excuse. This is something that is said multiple times during the series that Natalia didn't have shoes that were good, shoes that were going to be beneficial for her type of disability, but also I think in general, shoes that weren't great. Now, Natalia said she had not wanted to hurt Christine, and she never tried to. The Barnetts claim they took Natalia to a place called Ascension St. Vincent Stress Center in Indianapolis. And Michael claims that after observing Natalia, the people at the stress center told him she needed to be locked up, that there was no fixing her, and this was just how she was. It was never going to change, and she couldn't be allowed to have free reign of the house because she was a dangerous sociopath. Now, there's no evidence that I've seen that Natalia was at the stress center. She may have been, but I will say there's absolutely no evidence that I have seen that this is what the Barnetts were told. And I feel like if the Barnetts had this evidence, they'd be flashing it all over the place because all they want to do is prove to you that they're not lying when, in fact, I think they are. Now, after the electric fence issue, the Barnetts brought Natalia to another mental health facility, LaRue Carter Indiana State Mental Hospital, where she remained for several weeks. Just how many weeks depends on which interview from the Barnetts you're listening to. In the docu-series, Michael says she stayed there for a few weeks. Later, in the same series, in the same episode, he says a month. In an earlier interview, the Barnett said she was there for nine weeks. But either way, it doesn't really matter. Allegedly, she was there for an extended period of time. Michael tells us that here, under 24-7 observation, Natalia admitted out loud and wrote in her journal about wanting to kill Christine and her three sons. She claimed she was going to stab them with a knife, drag their bodies outside, and hide them under the porch. 
For the docu-series, they brought in a few of these alleged state hospital employees to talk about Natalia's time there. But these people didn't actually come in and, you know, sit down and show their faces on camera. These people would only speak under the protection of anonymity because they said they were worried about their employment. And under the protection of anonymity, they made all sorts of bizarre claims. So one woman says, you know, there's no way Natalia was a child. I think this woman was like an orderly or something at uh, at the hospital. She said Natalia was aggressive and manipulative. And I mean, these are all things that children can certainly be, especially children with behavioral problems. Now, another guy, also an orderly, I believe, he says Natalia pretended she could not speak English, but then she would speak English when not many people were around. This same orderly says, quote, I remember she used to fight with the staff. We gave her an injection on her backside, obviously, and she was fighting. So one of the first things you notice is she does have pubic hair, end quote. That's just a concerning statement all around, right, especially coming from a man. Knowing that Natalia was a little girl and wondering what else happened to her in that facility, why in the world is a male orderly in the same room as a minor female patient when she's exposed? That should not be happening. So what happened to her in that facility? That these people want to talk so much shit and talk about her behavioral problems and talk about how she was aggressive and manipulative. Like, this is a mental health hospital. Isn't that kind of your thing? Isn't that what you're supposed to be helping her with, (laughs) you assholes? A female employee of the mental health hospital, the state hospital, she said that Natalia was all adult and she looked mature and busty. And Natalia talked about sex a lot. She would flirt with the male patients and she even offered to give them sex for money. Now, let's unpack this. First of all, all these people are anonymous, so I don't know who they are. I don't know who they freaking are. I don't know if they actually worked at LaRue Carter. I don't know anything about them. I don't know if they are mentally ill themselves, okay? The docu-series said these people wanted to remain anonymous to protect their jobs, but the hospital closed in 2020. So how do I know that these people even worked there? Or how do I know they weren't being paid off by the Barnetts to say these things? We don't know who they are, so we can't verify their identities. And honestly, we can't trust what their motives are for saying these things. I just can't trust people who won't even say this kind of shit with their chest, with their face, and with their real name. I just can't. And like, honestly, I'm not going to just trust Investigation Discovery to do their research and make sure that these people are like legitimate and valid because I just know that they don't always do that. Not just ID. I mean, everybody. Like everybody who does these documentaries doesn't always do them in the most moral or, you know, research-backed way. It's more about like sensationalism. So I don't know if what they're saying is true because I can't look at them, who they are, what their motives might be, see their bank accounts to see if they've gotten an infusion of cash recently to say these things. I just don't know. But let's say some of this is true and Natalia was talking about wanting to kill Christine and the boys. Maybe it's because she'd been told that this is what she wanted and this is what she'd been doing and saying. Maybe she'd been dropped off at this facility and threatened You aren't coming back home unless you tell them exactly what we say. And there's going to be evidence of the Barnetts instructing Natalia to tell people certain things that were not true, such as what her age was. As far as the age and appropriate sexual overtness, that could be due to a lot of things. First of all, that one male so-called employee talking about Natalia's pubic hair. I am so sick of all of these people in this freaking docu-series talking about how she had like boobs and she was developing and they could see her bra like so inappropriate you want to talk about being sexually inappropriate talking that way about a child is sexually inappropriate okay so to me that dude's a big red flag red flag city am i right behavior that natalia allegedly showed can be indicative of sexual abuse And if it didn't happen at this state psychiatric facility, it could have happened at any of the other places she'd been shuffled to, even at the Barnetts, okay? I'm also quite certain that being dropped off at a state facility and left there for weeks didn't feel very good or safe for Natalia. She was probably acting out. It's like you want to treat this kid like garbage and then expect her to act like, you know, a a pearl. I don't understand. I don't know why I said pearl, but you know what I mean? Like you're going to treat her so poorly, but you expect her to act well. I don't understand. So in March of 2012, one of the Barnett's neighbors reported them to CPS because Natalia had been left outside at night to sleep. Now, what happened was Christine was torturing Natalia in what Michael described as the who are you game. Christine would tell Natalia to write down the names of people she knew or people 
people she'd been with so that the Barnetts could contact these people and find out if Natalia was really who she said she was. And actually, at that point, they didn't believe that she was who she said she was. They just wanted to figure out you know, who she was. So they would say, who are you? Who are you? Christine would just like, just completely beat on this poor girl. But Natalia, being a child and all, didn't have that information. And so she just kept saying, you know, I am a child. I am Natalia. I'm from the Ukrainian orphanage. Like, that is all I know. My birthday is in 2003. That is what I know. And none of these were adequate responses for Christine. So Christine told Natalia, okay, you want to be honest? You want to tell us the truth about who you are? Well, you no longer have a room or a bed, and you can sleep outside on the deck, which obviously was traumatic and horrible and probably made Natalia feel once again like trash. And so she was outside crying for hours, and a neighbor called the police. What did you think would happen, Christine Barnett, you dumbass? Now, according to Michael, a detective Scott Klaus of the Westfield City Police Department began investigating Natalia's past because Michael said that the detective came in and he could tell right away that Natalia was not the victim here. And the family, especially the boys, were in great danger. Michael said that Detective Klaus gave him a card, a business card, with the name of a lawyer on it. And Detective Klaus told Michael, you guys should legally have Natalia's age changed because this can often be an issue with foreign-born children. Couples adopting want younger children, so the birth certificates and paperwork for an older child would be modified to reflect a younger age. This does happen sometimes with adoptions. Nobody's disputing that. And yes, during those times, you will sometimes see a child, an orphan, being re-aged to reflect their proper and appropriate age but never in the way that Natalia was re-aged. That's ludicrous. We'll talk about that. Also, allegedly, Natalia admitted to this detective that she'd been instructed by the orphanage in the Ukraine to tell people that her birth year was 2003. And they they say this like it's like, oh, my God, she was told to say her birth year was 2003. Her birth year is 2003. You know, she couldn't read. So they told her, your birth year is 2003 so that she could pass that information on if asked. They just told her basic things like, this is your name. This is your birthday. You know, like, why is this like, oh my God, what? They told her to say her birth year was 2003. They didn't tell her to lie about it. So in the docuseries, Michael Barnett literally says, this is our legal recommendation from the police department, end quote, meaning going to a judge and having Natalia's age changed. Remember, I said that the Barnetts want as little responsibility for this decision as possible because this decision led them to considering her as an adult legally and leaving her and abandoning her in an apartment by herself. They could not do that to a nine-year-old, but they could do that to a 22-year-old, right? It's wrong and horrible neglect and legal to do that to a nine-year-old, perfectly legal and acceptable when that person is 22. So now they can say, this is what the doctors said, right? The doctors told us that she was not a child or one doctor told them that. This is what the police told us to do. They said, get her re-aged. This isn't what we wanted to do. This wasn't our decision. This wasn't like driven by us. Now, is that actually what Detective Scott Klaus told Michael? Hey, get her re-aged. You know, this happens all the time and she's dangerous. And I think, she, you know, you're in grave danger. You and your family are in grave danger. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure what he said verbally to Michael Barnett because, unfortunately, Detective Klaus died in 2015 and we can't ask him. But what we can do is look at his reports from during his investigation into Natalia. And we can see that on March 22nd, 2012, Detective Scott Klaus wrote an email to Heather Wilson, who was a CPS social worker. And he stated that he was attaching a picture of Natalia taken at entry, at her entry into the United States, where it appeared she had baby teeth. He attached another picture of Natalia from 2010, where it appeared she had adult teeth. And he said, quote, it appears for all purposes of our investigation, she is a child, end quote. So. Did Detective Klaus tell Michael to get Natalia's age changed, but he didn't write that in his report? He actually wrote in his report the contrary of everything Michael claims he said? Or did Michael just say that Detective Klaus said that, knowing that the man was no longer alive to dispute it? What do you think happened? Now, at this point, allegedly, when Detective Scott Klaus is like, oh, you are totally right, Michael. She's an adult psychopath and you and your family are in danger. At the point that Detective Scott Klaus says this, allegedly, 
Michael's feeling vindicated. Finally, someone sees what he sees and has given him actionable steps to protect himself and his family from this sociopathic adult using a fake Ukrainian passport. So the Barnetts, they're going to like do something about this. They got to figure out how old is she really? How do we re-age her to the proper age? So they went back to the adoption agency in Florida to see if they could get some information about where Natalia was before she ended up with them. But once again, because it was a closed adoption, they got no answers. But a woman who worked there called Michael back, and he claims she was basically like, I can't tell you anything, but I can instruct you to look carefully through Natalia's luggage because there you will find a clue. Michael claims that they found a luggage tag in Natalia's backpack with the names Gary and Diane Chacon. The Chacones have not made a public statement at this time, so we're not going to talk about them much. We're not going to say anything besides what we know for sure, which just isn't a lot. They were the couple who originally adopted Natalia from the Ukrainian orphanage in 2008, and they claimed allegedly that when they got Natalia, they were surprised because they'd been told she only had shingles, and they would find out that her condition, her health condition, was far more extensive and would take many expensive surgeries to address. In the affidavit of probable cause for Michael and Christine Barnett's arrest, it's all laid out for us. On July 30th, 2008, Dr. David Harris at the Children's Hospital in Boston examined Natalia with help from a Russian interpreter. Hold on, we're going to talk about what Dr. David Harris said, but I really want to focus on what I just said. He talked to Natalia, he examined her with help from a Russian interpreter. Now remember when we talked about this in the first video and in part one, I said, yeah, it's kind of weird. Like, why didn't she speak Ukrainian? Are they lying about her not speaking Ukrainian? Because they had a Ukrainian woman speak to Natalia and allegedly Natalia could not answer back. And Michael said that she just didn't know any, you know, of the language. And also she didn't have an accent, things like that. There seems to be a reason for that, right? The fact is, and a lot of you piped up with this in the comments, which I appreciate. So for instance, Finley Moratova said, the reason why Natalia might not have understood Ukrainian comes from the fact that a lot of people in Western Ukraine speak Russian. She might not have even spoken Ukrainian. And then somebody else said there are still places in eastern Ukraine where almost everyone speaks Russian, not Ukrainian, and there is no way someone spoke English to her in an orphanage. It's not happening in orphanages. Okay, so that makes a lot of sense. Also, there was people who said, you know, we've adopted children from different countries and before I think the age of like six or seven, they can learn a language without having like an accent. They won't have any accent. So that is very interesting. I appreciate all of your comments. I appreciate all of your collective knowledge. Amazing. This now makes a lot of sense why she didn't speak Ukrainian because she probably spoke Russian, which is why the doctor in Boston examined her with the help from a Russian interpreter. Anyways, this doctor, he diagnosed Natalia with kyphosis, which is an excessive curvature of the spine that causes hunching of the back. Another doctor, Dr. Samantha Spencer at the same hospital, also examined Natalia and further confirmed the diagnosis of dysplasia with associated muscular and skeletal issues, including severe dysplasia of her hips, severe club feet, and severe flexion contractures of her knees. Dr. Spencer said that some of these issues would need to be addressed within a few years' time, such as surgery on Natalia's hips, knees, and feet. And uh, there was a doctor at the hospital that was planning to perform a spinal fusion surgery on Natalia within yeah, at least that year or the next one. I wonder how expensive that would be. Probably very expensive. It sounds very expensive. On October 16th, 2008, Dr. Michael Mills at that same hospital confirmed a prior diagnosis of pectus excavatum, meaning Natalia's breastbone was sunken into her chest. We also have records from the Westfield Woods Elementary School, who Michael Barnett had written to, indicating that he was aware of the health problems that Natalia had and he was aware that the surgeries she needed were going to have to be completed in a timely manner because Natalia was suffering due to these surgeries being delayed. She was in a lot of pain. Michael and Christine Barnett appear to have provided the school district with records from the Children's Hospital in Boston, which means they were well aware of Natalia's health issues and they knew the kind of recommendations the doctors in Boston had made. They knew the kind of money and recovery time they would be looking at to accomplish all of them. And I also feel like they probably knew she was a child considering she was being seen at a children's hospital. And none of those doctors, medical professionals who work with children every day, ever said, hmm, there's something strange about this little girl. I don't think she's a child. I know children. That's my specialty. See, the word children is on the hospital that I work at. 
it's so funny that the Barnetts were so sure that Natalia was an adult and did not believe any of the, you know, 11, 12 medical professionals who, you know, said the contrary, said that she was a child. But they were so sure that she was an adult. And, of course, they would know better than, you know, doctors who spend 20 years learning about the human body and medicine and health and things like that. <laughs> course they know better because they're narcissists. And maybe that is the boat that the Chicones were in when they received Natalia, allegedly thinking that she had shingles. And then they brought her to the hospital in Boston to find out that her health issues went much deeper than that. And they would have to, you know, pay some money and they were going to have to put out a lot of like it was just going to be a harder road for them than they expected and you know she was just an orphan that they adopted what do they need to keep her around for you know it's not like she's related to them by blood or anything I'm sorry I just really have a big 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 problem with people who adopt children because they think it's going to be cute and fun and then when it's hard because it's going to be hard just parenting in general is hard parenting a child that uh, you know didn't live with you forever and has already had experiences and trauma before they even met you is going to obviously be much harder. And then they're just like, mm, this isn't as fun as I thought. I think I'll give her back. I hate people like that. I hate you if you do that. I hate you. If you do it with dogs too, I also hate you. So let's check out what I have here. I have some photos of Natalia in 2009 when she was technically still um, you know, adopted by the Chacones in New Hampshire. Not only does Natalia look like a little girl, in this picture. But in this one picture, you can see that she is missing some of her teeth, some of her baby teeth. And she would have been about six years old there. My daughter is six years old and she just lost the same teeth. So are we still thinking Natalia is an adult? Did she pull out her teeth and then have them mysteriously grow back in to just continue this facade of childhood, as Dr. McLaren put it? Now, why Gary and Diane Chacon ended up getting rid of Natalia or wanting to get rid of Natalia is a mystery. Um, once again, like I said, they have not you know, made a public statement. But if she was like a murderous like adult sociopath, I feel like they would have, you know? I feel like they're not making a statement because it's embarrassing because the reason they wanted to get rid of her wasn't because they were scared of her or because, you know, she, they thought she was going to kill them. It's because they just didn't want to deal with it. Maybe Natalia was exhibiting some of the same behavioral issues that the Barnetts have detailed. Maybe they realized that she desperately needed these surgeries and medical care and they felt, you know, we didn't sign up for this. It doesn't really matter. What does matter is the way they tried to get rid of her, which to me seems at, you know, the least a little unconventional and at the worst very heartless so in the docuseries michael barnett claims that within six months of getting natalia the chicones were taking her to little people conventions and trying to push her off on different couples he said they had located two of the families that the chicones had given natalia to one had natalia under the table for four months so i think he means without any paperwork, not legally done. And Michael Barnett is referring to the Irvings from Indiana. Judith Irving, who's clearly a good person, by the way, in my opinion, um, she says the first time she heard about Natalia was in an email she'd received from Little People of America, an organization where people with dwarfism can meet and come together once a year. They can make friends, build long-term relationships. Uh, they often find their life partners there. And the email said that there was a little girl with uh, dysplasia and her adopted family was trying to find a home for her. In the docuseries, Judith says, quote, when I saw her picture, I instantly fell in love. This little girl, Natalia, she's meant to be my daughter. I heard she loved to dance and sing and be creative. And I was like, yeah, she's meant to be with me, end quote. So sad because I feel like Judith really wanted Natalia and Natalia would have been so happy. Like if, if things have been different, and Judith Irving got Natalia. Natalia would have never ended up with the Barnetts. None of this would ever happen to her. But the Chacones told Judith that um, they wanted her to pay the adoption fees, you know, the fees that they had paid to get Natalia. And if she could do that, then Natalia was hers. But Diane Chacon told Judith that the adoption costs from the Ukraine were about $25,000. And Judith was like, that was a, it was just a lot of money. And it broke her heart. But her husband said they could not financially afford that much and they'd be unable to take Natalia. According to Judith, once the Chicones found out that she and her husband were not going to be able to take Natalia, they moved on very quickly to the next couple, Robin and Dwayne Ferris from Austin, Texas. The Ferrises had also received the same email as the Irvings in 2009, and the Ferrises began speaking to Diane Chacon, but things seemed off right from the start, especially when Diane asked the Ferrises if they would reimburse herself and her husband for Natalia's previous medical expenses and surgeries. 
Robin said that Diane came off like a used car salesperson trying to sell Natalia to them. But when the Ferrises said they would not be paying for expenses that occurred before they came into the picture, Diane didn't like it. She wasn't happy about it. She held on to it for a bit, but she eventually let that go. The Ferrises were also concerned about why the Chacones had adopted Natalia and then so quickly, within the year, wanted to get rid of her. So they asked if Natalia could have a psychological evaluation, but Diane Chacon said no. Even though they had seen some red flags, the Ferrises still wanted Natalia and they still traveled to New Hampshire to meet Natalia. And Robin Ferris said that Natalia was adorable. She was just about to turn six, and she looked like she was six, right? But uh, Robin and her husband also had a feeling that something bad was going on. Something wasn't right. Dwayne Fair said that Natalia was withdrawn and quiet and would only engage if she looked at Diane Chacon first to make sure her answers were appropriate. And the Ferris's felt that Natalia's answers were coached. They said that they felt Natalia had given one uncoached answer when they asked her how the Ukrainian orphanage had been, and she responded that it sucked. And Diane immediately cut in, and she was like, oh, no, 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 it wasn't that bad. And she seemed surprised and a little, like, offended that Natalia had responded in that way. Dwayne Ferris said, quote, It was almost like Diane had to give her approval to come out. And as soon as she said what she was coached to say, she went back in. I've never seen another person do that, even in the movies, end quote. And he means come out, like come out, speak, um, be engaged. And then she, Natalia would go back in like a turtle into her shell. And she'd have to wait for Diane to sort of give her permission to come back out and answer a question. And the Ferris's ultimately decided the whole situation made them feel far too uneasy. They didn't want to get involved by adopting Natalia. And when they told Diane Chacon that they were passing up this opportunity, uh, allegedly she went nuts, right? She was not happy. She was very angry. The Ferris's said that although things were sketchy, they never questioned that Natalia was a child. They were never like, oh, is she a child or is she an adult? Like, she was clearly a child. But Dwayne Ferris said that um, he had posted on a message board asking if anyone knew Natalia, knew of her, or had experience with her because he and his wife were still curious about what her situation was. And a year later, Michael Barnett reached out to the Ferris and he was like, oh, yes, I have experience with Natalia. Me and my wife adopted her in 2010, and, you know, I want to talk to you about her. Christine Barnett and Robin Ferris began chatting on Facebook, and Robin said that there seemed to be some shady stuff going on, stating, quote, Michael and Christine Barnett lie a lot. They'll do anything to get what they want. They'll lie about Natalia being violent. You just don't know the true Barnetts, end quote. The Ferris has said that Christine was telling them these crazy stories about Natalia and how she was trying to kill everyone. And they never believed her because Natalia was a child and she was tiny and they knew that Christine was lying. Robin said, quote, Christine was using me and Dwayne because if she could get us on her side, believing that Natalia had issues, she would feel justified in maybe getting rid of her. Michael and Christine Barnett not only lied to get her in their family, but they also lied to get rid of her, end quote. Now, good question is, what does that mean exactly? that the Barnetts lied to get Natalia and their family. Well, we find out at the end of episode two in the series that in early 2010, a home study report was prepared by a licensed social worker on Michael and Christine Barnett. And this would probably be the home study that they were required to go through in order to be eligible to adopt a child. Now, in the study, Michael and Christine were both asked if there was history of substance abuse, sexual abuse, or domestic violence in their relationship and their family, and they both responded no. Apparently, the social worker thought that the Barnetts were honest people. I'm not sure what gave her that impression. But in general, it was never checked. They never checked with local law enforcement to see if the claim was accurate, if Christine and Michael Barnett were literally being honest when they said no, no domestic violence, no sexual abuse, nothing. Everything's perfect. We are the perfect family. Can you not tell? But there was domestic abuse. There was a violence in the relationship. And if this agency that had done the home study had just looked and checked into it, they would have found that in September of 2003, it appears that Christine threatened to leave Michael and he didn't like that. She accused him of picking her up, throwing her. He put her in a headlock. The report also claims that Christine hit Michael several times. It turns out the happy, wholesome family had some dark secrets, with even neighbors seeing Christine and Michael Barnett in the yard screaming at each other constantly and Christine verbally abusing Michael, although I can't really blame her. He's the worst. Let's return back to Michael Barnett, who claims he had a, quote, legal recommendation from the police department when Detective Klaus told the Barnetts to get Natalia's age changed. Once again, we don't know what this police officer actually told Michael Barnett in person, but we do know in his email to the social worker 
Detective Klaus said that after his investigation, he believed Natalia was a child. Remember I said that in June of 2012, a bone density scan was done on Natalia at Peyton Manning Hospital, and it was determined that Natalia's estimated age was 11. Well, that same month, the Barnetts filed an ex parte petition in the Marion Supreme Court Probate Division to have Natalia's birth year changed from 2003 to 1989. One of the pieces of evidence they used to prove their claims was Dr. McLaren's statement that he believed Natalia was older than she claimed. They also used a statement from a social worker, Susan Witten. Um, I'm not sure what Susan's expertise was in this kind of scenario. They didn't show the judge that they were asking to change Natalia's age. They didn't show him all the doctors from the Boston Hospital or from Peyton Manning Hospital or from, you know, Easy Dental or any of the dentists that they brought her to that said she was a child. They just showed Dr. McLaren's, like, three-paragraph statement without any, like, you know, actual medical report or any evidence or proof. And Susan Witten, who I don't know what her freaking expertise was, I'm so over this. It's ridiculous to me. They also used the fact that Natalia had not grown in four years. She hadn't grown an inch in four years. Additionally, the petition read, quote, Petitioners were concerned that Natalia was not seven years old but much older due to her ability to hide her physical characteristics, statements of detailed alleged abuse, her differing stories of timelines, her level of intelligence, her ability to act differently in different situations, her level of ability to manipulate, her extensive vocabulary, and her physical characteristics, end quote. Um, that's all, that's all like ridiculous. On the Justice for Natalia Grace blog spot, the author of the blog notes that this petition also claimed the age change would allow the Barnetts to seek out services for Natalia that she would otherwise be denied. But in reality, changing Natalia's age denied her even more because she was only eight at the time. So if you're changing her age from eight to 22, she's going to be denied an education. So she's not going to get any uh, elementary, middle, high school, nothing. She would also be denied all the surgeries that she needed as a growing child, which would make her condition and pain much worse as she grew older. She's not going to be covered under the Barnett's health insurance. And there's a reason, I think, that 22 was the age that they chose. And this petition was approved by a judge, Gerald Zor, from the Marion Superior Court in Indianapolis. And according to Beth Karras in the docu-series, deciding Natalia's new legal age was basically just an arbitrary decision. And the judge said, well, if Natalia hasn't grown in four years and you stop growing at 18, I guess that makes her 22. And just like that, without Natalia even present, without her having an attorney to represent her interests, without her even knowing what was going on, her birth date was legally changed from September 4th, 2003 to September 4th, 1989. And she was 22 years old. All of a sudden, just like that, in a second. Natalia got a new birth certificate with a new birth date. She got an Indiana state ID. She was now legally an adult. She could drink. She could vote. She could have sex with somebody of an advanced age. And that would all be considered legal. Okay? Now, it seems a big jump to age a person from 8 years old to 22. But nonetheless, that happened. It happened. Even Beth Karras in the docu-series, she said it doesn't make sense to jump 14 years in age. You know, like, you usually, if you're going to take a child like this, a foreign-born child, and you're like, ah, oh, I think that, you know, her, her age or his age isn't exactly accurate, maybe you'd add a couple of years, you know? Oh, she's not 5, she's actually 8. But to go from 8 to 22 is ludicrous, and everybody involved with this should be thrown in prison. So this woman named Michelle Jackson, uh, she represented the Barnetts in the reaging process as an attorney. Uh, she said, quote, At the time of the reaging, there was good, solid documentation of an approximate age, and she had a primary care physician who looked at all of it and also provided evidence. So that doctor was looking at lots of other doctors' information and coming up with a determination. And at that point, when it's such a huge amount of years, you just have to say what makes the most sense based upon the evidence and the professionals and what they think, and that it's in the best interest of the child to change their age, end quote. Well, first of all, in my opinion, this Michelle Jackson woman seems very nervous during this interview in the series. But I give her credit, honestly, for even having the balls to show her face after being involved with this shit show travesty. 
But did she also refer to Natalia as a child when in the same breath she said there was plenty of evidence from medical professionals to prove otherwise? And that's actually not true. It's not true at all. It's a lie because as we know, out of all of the doctors who examined Natalia since her arrival in the United States, only Dr. McLaren, Michael's primary care physician, stated that he believed Natalia was older than she claimed. And if what Ms. Jackson over here is stating to be true is true, that Dr. McLaren reviewed notes and records from the other doctors, he would have found out that there was no proof of Natalia's age being incorrect. So who needs to get fired here? Who needs to spend some time behind bars for being so irresponsible and careless with the child's life? Everyone? Okay, fine with me. Even after this sham of a reaging process, medical professionals were still telling the Barnetts that their adopted daughter was actually a child. In July of 2012, a dental x-ray of Natalia was taken by a Dr. Ronald Deckard from Mobile Dental Health Care Services. Based on the x-rays, the doctor estimated Natalia to be between six and nine years of age. And although he was given 1989 as a birth year for Natalia, he did not believe that to be accurate at all. And he was like, what the heck are you talking about? This child is like not 22 years old. So now we come to the part of this story where um, Natalia is hidden away in the first apartment. And she was told that the Barnetts were doing this, putting her someplace else to live because they were concerned about having her in their home. They basically came home after the reaging process, right? They were like, by the way, Natalia, we just went to a judge. You're no longer eight. You're now 22. So when people ask, you should tell them that you're an adult and you're 22. And also, you're not going to be living here anymore. Uh, we're going to put you in an apartment because we're scared of you and because you tell us you're going to kill us. And so we don't want you here. Now, in August of 2012, Christina brought Natalia to a rented apartment in Westfield, Indiana. Now, this first place wasn't too bad, admittedly, because it was a single floor unit. There weren't a bunch of stairs for Natalia to climb up in order to get into her apartment. And it wasn't a nicer part of town, according to Michael, the most expensive part of town, a prestigious neighborhood, if you will. But keep in mind, Natalia is just eight years old, no matter what any of you trolls say. And she's expected to live by herself in that apartment with her extensive disabilities that already make life more difficult for her. According to the Barnetts, they paid the first three months of her rent up front. They set her up with a disability, social security, and food stamps, and allegedly hired a home health aide to check in on Natalia. Oh, I also want to drop in here because I'm not able to put clips in. And I want to say that nosy neighbor Rachel Ambler finally comes around in episode three as it begins to dawn on her that the Barnetts are not good people after all. You know, maybe their squeaky clean image was a facade covering something really toxic and broken. Rachel said that she feels Christine didn't know what to do with Natalia. So why not say she's 22 and stick her in an apartment? And that's exactly the case. That's exactly what happened, right? Natalia's an adult. She's not our problem. Not only is she an adult, but she's a 22-year-old adult. Which just so happens to be the age in Indiana where parents are no longer financially responsible for their children. How convenient. Okay, let's talk about the neighbors from the Westfield apartment because this is where I really started getting angry. This is where someone should have stepped in and helped Natalia, called someone, did something, but instead they just talked shit about her and in many ways seemed afraid of her. I think it was because Natalia was starved for attention and love and family and adult direction. I think it was because she'd been left to her own devices and she was a child who didn't know how to care for herself and because often she was hungry, like for food, you know, thirsty for attention, hungry for food. And it's very simple. I think it's as simple as that. She probably was annoying to them, but she's a child. When human beings are desperate, they'll do anything to get their needs met, whether those needs are physical, like food, or emotional, like a desire to not be alone and lonely. I have a six-year-old daughter and an 11-year-old son, and neither one of them could live on their own. And it wouldn't be just about like the basic necessities. I suppose they could figure out how to eat and things like that. They could probably figure out how to do a lot of things, bathe themselves if they had to. But they would be crying and so sad every day because they wouldn't have that comfort and security that children need almost as much as food and water. So the neighbors of Natalia's that we're going to talk about um, in, in this video today are Sue McCallum. She's an older grandma type with a cane. She seems very sweet at first. We also have Melanie and Toby Miles, a married couple who lived across the street from Natalia, and Andrew Rice, a man who lived not in the apartments but like in, in the like 
suburban area right across the street from the apartments. So Sue McCallum said that she first had met Natalia by accident. I see her mom sitting out all her grocery sacks on the sidewalk, and I thought her back was to me, and I thought, my gosh, that poor little girl carrying those groceries in. So I went up there. I was going to the mailbox, and I said, well, honey, do you need some help? And I said, where's your mom? And she turned around, she said, I'm 22. I expect her to have, you know, young, but she's not. She was an adult. You could tell by looking at her. And, well, her mom had a Cadillac, <laughs> and she was sitting in her Cadillac while I was helping her carry the groceries in because she just left them on the sidewalk and left them, just sit there and watched us carry it in. And she didn't even roll down the window and say, thanks for helping her or nothing, nothing. She just sat there and looked and then took off. I thought it was rude because Natalia couldn't hardly open the darn front door, you know, work the key and get in. So I took him in and carried him into the uh, kitchen for it. And so, you know, I took her to the grocery store a couple times and she was also on food stamps. She had a food stamp card when I take her to the grocery store. And I thought, well, if you can drive a Cadillac, why can't you take better care of her, <laughs> you know? Sue says a few things in this clip that are important. And like I said, Sue seems very nice, very kind, but she says it was clear Natalia was an adult. And Natalia even told Sue that she was 22. This is going to come up a lot, that Natalia confirms her legal age to people, not her real age, not her actual age, but her legal age of 22. But we now know that allegedly, according to Natalia, this is because she was instructed by Michael and Christine Barnett to do so probably threatened to do so. I also think that because of Natalia's condition and the fact that she doesn't necessarily resemble an eight-year-old that Sue McCallum would see every day, it probably contributed to Sue saying that Natalia looked like an adult. But Sue also gives us some insight into Christine Barnett here, who was sitting in a Cadillac watching Natalia struggle to get her bags of groceries in and watching a helpful stranger assist Natalia with this task without any acknowledgement or thanks. And then she speeds away. That's because Christine Barnett is an entitled bitch who thinks that everybody just exists to serve her and make her life better. And honestly, Christine wanted nothing to do with this child. And it takes a really cold-hearted person to do the things that Christine did, this included. We also heard from married couple Melanie and Toby Miles, who live directly across from Natalia. Toby said that the first time they met Natalia, he and his wife were outside planting flowers, and Natalia came running across the street towards them. What's going on here? And at first it stressed me out because I thought she was just a little kid crossing the street. And then she came over and started talking to us. And, you know, definitely wasn't a child. Um, definitely. It, it was super nice, expressed herself well, and, you know, just was being friendly with us. She introduces herself, she sits right down, starts a conversation like we've been friends for years. So, and that didn't bother me. Real At sociopath. Real sociopath she is. At the time. Okay, Toby. Okay. So I will say, I understand fully that as Natalia became more thirsty for attention and more lonely, as she spent more time alone without anybody there to take care of her, I'm sure her behavior did intensify, and we're going to talk about it. And as someone who values their privacy and doesn't really consider herself to be neighborly, I can see how this would have rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. But the things they noticed about Natalia, the fact that she clearly wasn't being cared for, didn't know how to care for herself, they should have called someone. But they probably thought no one in their right minds would actually stick an actual child into an apartment alone. And they didn't know about the whole reaging process. And so they probably just trusted that Natalia was an adult because she was in an apartment alone. And so her actions appeared more scary and more nefarious. But I will also say, I think uh, Toby Miles was also a little overdramatic and pearl clutching about the whole situation. Like, relax, dude. Chill the fuck out. You are like, doing too much. Him and Michael should get together for a beer and cry about how much an eight-year-old girl scared them. Oh, and then there's someone I call anonymous neighbor lady because she never shows her face or gives her name. Um, we're going to talk about the things that she says. She's the worst of all. It always seems that people say the worst, most horrible things 
when they're not showing their face or giving you their name. And then they just feel free to just completely vomit out hate and vitriol. So Andrew Rice, like I said, another neighbor of Natalia's. And he said that Natalia would sometimes play with his four-year-old grandson. They're talking to my grandson and they started playing in the driveway. They were riding the electric motorcycle up and down the driveway and having races. On your mark, get set, go. My first impression of Natalia was that um, she was a, a little person. I didn't necessarily think she was a child at first. Um, and as we got to speak with her, she actually admitted that she was 26 years old at that point. Um, and she told us that she lived in the apartments down the street, um, which were only two, three houses down across the street. But as the sun started to set, it started to cool down a little bit. And I know Natalia didn't have a jacket on that day, and we were jacketed up because it started getting cool. It also seemed like she hadn't done some of the basic hygienic things that most people would normally do. Um, her hair was a little bit dirty, and there was, for lack of a better word, an unpleasant body odor um, that she emitted. I really hope that uh, YouTube lets me keep that clip in because it shows you something I believe is very, very clear. Natalia walked away from her apartment alone as an eight-year-old to find someone to play with. And when she did find a little boy to play with, she was happy as pie to just roll around in the driveway with him. She looks happy in this video. She sounds happy, but more importantly, she looks and sounds like an eight-year-old kid who's having fun. I think that Natalia got proficient at switching her demeanor, depending on who she was talking to. So if she was with adults, she'd be more reserved, more adult. If she was with kids, she felt more freedom to be her childlike self. Even Andrew Rice says this. When she was with my grandson playing with him, she sounded like a child. She behaved like a child. When she was with adults, she sounded like an adult. She behaved like an adult. Maybe that's what the Barnetts meant when they stated Natalia was able to act differently in different situations. But being able to do that is not necessarily an adult thing or a sociopath thing. It's a protection thing. It's a I need to fit in or else I'm going to be abandoned again thing, right? This is what people do so that they aren't viewed as other, so that they aren't viewed as outside of the norm, outside of society, outside of the circle of, you know, care and trust and comfort. Andrew Rice also said that Natalia told him her age was 26, which, as we know, is not her legal age of 22 or her real age of 8 at that point. But I think by then she probably forgot what she was supposed to say because she often gives different ages and has a hard time remembering her real age and her real birth year because she's been told so many things. That was a big thing when she was on Dr. Phil. And Dr. Phil was like, ew, it's weird that you're, you don't know your birthday. Why do you have to think about it? Like, shut up, Dr. Phil, you dumbass. She's been told so many things. She's been so twisted up she yeah she's gonna have a hard time like just spitting it out like you or I could when we've only been told for our entire lives however long we've been on this planet our birthday is a certain day and we are a certain age and now you know we don't have a million things swirling around in our heads to confuse us and make us have to think about it Andrew Rice also noted that Natalia didn't have the proper clothing for the weather as it was getting cooler at night, and it didn't look as if she was practicing good hygiene. Her hair was sort of greasy, unwashed, unbrushed, and she smelled a little bit like body odor. Sue McCallum also mentioned that Natalia seemed to wear the same clothing for days and days, and her shoes were worn and scuffed up. This is the third person in the series who mentioned that Natalia didn't have good shoes. Um, it was the other family that was going to adopt her who had traveled to New Hampshire to see her. And they were like, oh, how is, she, how is Natalia like walking around without shoes? She just has these brace things. She doesn't have any good shoes. Toby Miles said, quote, I remember distinctly looking at her, you know, after seeing dirty clothes and wondering, can she take her clothes off to wash them? Can she put clean clothes on herself? How many days in a row has she worn that? Does she only get to change clothes when someone is there to help her? End quote. Super good questions, Toby. Doesn't it seem like, you know, this, this girl needs some help? Like maybe she's going through it and her life's not great. And maybe that's why she's always like annoying you and bugging you for companionship and, and friendship. Toby's wife, Melanie, who is not as annoying as her husband, she said that Natalia didn't get a lot of visitors. She never saw Natalia's mother or brother's visit. And the only person that Melanie ever saw visit Natalia was a person she assumed to be Natalia's father. But he didn't come often and he never stayed long. 
all the neighbors who saw Michael Barnett remembered him because of his yellow Corvette, which stuck out like a sore thumb in the apartment complex. After noticing that Natalia was not being cleaned and cared for, and it seemed like she was struggling to do basic things like take the trash out due to her disability, somebody at the apartment complex did contact Child Services. Now this did stick out to me because if these neighbors believed that Natalia was an adult, like they said they did, why did they call Child Services to help? Child Services. An investigation began and Heather Wilson, the same social worker who had, you know, investigated the previous March when the Barnetts had forced Natalia to sleep outside on the deck, she was brought in again. And needless to say, Michael and Christine did not like Heather Wilson or anyone else sticking their noses into this weird little plot that they had going on. And there's a video of Michael Barnett going over to Natalia's apartment and it's so, whoo, it's so triggering to me. It's so twisted. It's so sad. I really hope that I can put these clips in because Michael is so mean to Natalia. So, ooh, I don't, mean's not the right word. I don't know what the right word is. I'll come up with it. But you can tell that she's just trying to show him that she's been trying her best. She's been trying to take care of the things she needs to do. And he is just so condescending and rude and dismissive and like just horrible to her. If Michael Barnett believed Natalia was an adult, he didn't speak to her with an ounce of respect. And in fact, it's very evident that the Barnetts wanted Natalia isolated from anyone who might put two and two together, like typical abusers, right? That's what abusive husbands do. That's what abusive spouses do. They make sure you're isolated from your friends, your family. That way, no one can help you or no one can notice what's happening to you. Wait, what do you want? I came over. I was just taking a walk and I got all the bins emptied out. Yeah, I'm going to grab them. Where were you walking around? I was just walking around on the sidewalk around here. In, this, in, in the apartment complex area? Yeah. I drove all through here. I didn't see you. Okay. How could you have been walking on the sidewalk if I drove through here and didn't see you? I, I was uh, back there, walking around back there, for, and I was coming back over here. Yeah, like right over there? Yeah. I drove over there. Okay. Heather was here, huh? Mm -hmm. What did you guys talk about? They got another report on me. Who, had they got another report on you? Yeah. And did Heather talk about what she's trying to do? No. Okay. No, I think she did. Well, um, Heather told us, you told her that we only bring you food every two months. Mm -hmm. And I showed her all the receipts. Right. For all the food I bring over. And she mm -hmm. knew you were lying about that. Um, <laughs> they were going to, they're going to try and do stuff, but... We showed everything to our lawyer, and our lawyer said that they can't do anything. They're, they're not even supposed to come over here. So whatever Heather was trying with you, didn't work. Everything about Michael Barnett screams controlling abuser. If Natalia is an adult, why the hell do you care where she was walking what she was doing? Why do you care? Why are you grilling her about this? He doesn't actually care. But he has to keep constant tabs on her. And more than that, he has to make her feel as if she's not free to do as she pleases. And then Michael asks Natalia about Heather Wilson. And he's like, oh, Heather said that you told her we only bring you food every two months. And Natalia's like, yeah, as in, yep, that's what I said, because that's accurate. That's what's happening. And Michael was like, well, joke's on you. We showed her the receipts and she knows you're lying. And whatever she's trying to do to help you won't work. So just give up because no one's coming to help you. You have no one but us. So you best behave. That's basically what's happening here. It's gaslighting at its finest. And he talks in this voice, which seems casual and almost friendly, but there's venom dripping from each word. I know a woman like this who speaks in this high, sing-songy, sweet voice, but what she's saying is literal burns on everyone all the time, man. And I always say, you don't have to be yelling or swearing to be mean, insulting, and degrading. In the series, Beth Kara said that it appeared the Barnetts were not regularly buying groceries for Natalia until after DCFS reopened their investigation. And it is clear to me throughout this episode that Natalia is hungry all the time. Look at this clip when Michael comes in on one of his visits and finds a box of donuts and he berates Natalia about where she got the donuts from. Where did you get donuts from? I don't remember buying donuts. You don't know? Didn't know where I think donuts came from? That's a lie. <laughs> Seriously, where did donuts come from? I found out when I was sorting out the cabinets. You just found the donuts in there? Yeah. But they're still good. Let's see if they have a date on them. Oh, it's an April 
April 23rd, which means they're new. So where did it come from? Sure, we're done with numbers. Who brought that? Who? Sue. Sue, the lady over there, is she in the office? Yeah. Why'd she bring you donuts? Well, you never tell me the truth. So yeah, this, this, um, this, ooh, this is very triggering for me as someone who's been in an abusive relationship with a controlling abuser. Sometimes you don't want to give your abuser the truth because although you know you've done nothing wrong and whatever happened was clearly benign and, you know, not illegal, not immoral, not wrong, you also know that your abuser isn't logical and they don't want you doing things that are outside of their control and they will blame and punish you for whatever happened. The fact that Michael recorded this exchange and thought it made him look like the good guy in the scenario is further proof that he's a narcissist with zero self-awareness. The video continues. Michael's asking Natalia what else she talked about with Heather, and her eyes keep sliding towards him and then sliding away as she answers, which is a sign that she's checking his face for his reaction to make sure she's saying the right things. And she says, oh, you know, I told her I'm crazy. I've been acting crazy. And he's like, mm-hmm, yeah, that's what you better tell her, you know. And then somehow, Michael and Christine Barnett were able to get Natalia to write a letter, taking everything back. All the claims she had made about not getting groceries, being left alone, about not having access to a cell phone or a telephone at all, Natalia recanted everything in this letter and also took blame for everything. Now, I should add that this letter is clearly written by the hand of a child. <laughs> it's written by a child. But I don't need any more proof that she was a child. Do you? If you do, more is coming. I got DNA. I got, I got all sorts of stuff. So in the letter, Natalia said, oh, listen, I know I told people that I didn't have toilet paper, but I do. I did have toilet paper. I had a jumbo pack that Christine and Michael gave me, but I used it all so I could tell people my mom wasn't taking care of me. Natalia said, I also hid my clothes so I could tell people I don't have clothes. And I told people that the milk in my refrigerator was curdled and old and I couldn't drink it so they'd feel bad for me. Not because it was true. Michael and Christine always make sure I have fresh milk. Everything's perfect. And then Natalia wrote, quote, I'm doing this because I'm trying to intimidate mom and dad. And I'm trying to frame them by making my parents look mean, end quote. Intimidate's a big word for an eight-year-old to spell correctly, don't you think? Oh, wait, she didn't. She spelled it like it sounds. Intimidate, right? Intimidate. You know, like a kid would do. In my opinion, the Barnetts made Natalia write that letter because they just didn't want anyone poking around. And anonymous neighbor lady said that one day after this, she saw Christine and Natalia exit the apartment and Natalia's hair was wet and she was wearing clean clothes. And then Christine marched Natalia over to anonymous neighbor lady and made Natalia apologize. She made Natalia tell anonymous neighbor lady that everything she had said was a lie. Everything Natalia told anonymous neighbor lady and all the other neighbors was a lie. And yet, and yet, this anonymous neighbor lady and the other neighbors can see this shit go down and still be like, oh, Natalia is a scary, mean person who's just annoying all of us. Michael Barnett also recorded himself deleting everything off of Natalia's cell phone, including Heather Wilson's contact information. This was a very disturbing part. Like I said, the fact that he's recording this stuff, knowing somebody might see it, maybe even intending people to see it, is concerning. That he literally would do something so horrible, so abusive, and think that it made him look good. Michael also made sure to let Natalia know, literally verbatim, now you can't talk to Heather anymore. Translation, once again, now you're alone. No one's coming to save you. And it's so sad. He's like, I'm erasing everything off this phone. She goes, okay, or something. And he's like, now you can't talk to Heather anymore. And she goes, oh, like, she just doesn't even know what she's like. She's just like, leave, man. You've tortured me enough. Just leave. Like, whatever you want. Take my phone. Take the food. Leave me alone. I can't do this anymore. She's completely, like, disassociating. She's doing whatever she can to survive. It is so traumatic to watch. So these asshole neighbors spend the rest of the episode complaining about Natalia. You know, she'd be waiting on their doorstep for them to come home. And then she would walk inside with them. And she would look at things like she was casing the joint, according to Sue McCallum. She was a pest to everyone. Toby Miles said it was always a worry that Natalia would be waiting around the corner, ready to wrap him into a conversation, and it stressed him out. Yes, conversations with children are very stressful, Toby. I understand. You felt like you couldn't even leave your own house at some point. Toby said that he and his wife, Melanie, they always tried to be good neighbors, and they'd help someone out if they could. That good old Midwestern, friendly, neighborly love. But 
He said he felt that they were quickly taken advantage of by Natalia. She would call their cell phones a lot to see when they would be home, if they weren't home. She always wanted to be with them, and as soon as she saw them come home, she would run right across the street. And once again, I understand this is annoying and intrusive. But she was a lonely kid who didn't have anyone to love her or keep her company. Of course, she's going to latch on to any adult around who gives her even like the smallest bit of kindness. That's more sad than annoying. That's like, let me get you help, man. You know, let me me help you. Let me do something for you. Let me keep calling CPS until they actually take me seriously. And Sue McCallum said no one liked Natalia. She literally says this. No one liked her. Some of us felt sorry for her, but no one liked her. And everyone just kept calling the office complaining about Natalia. Like, we need to get her out of here. They didn't complain like, oh, she needs help. They're like, get her out of here. Evict her. And the apartment complex office was like, listen, we're keeping an eye on her. We're getting reports, but there's not much we can do at this point. We have to take certain steps to evict someone. We can't just kick her out because she annoys you. There are reports of Natalia walking into people's houses, opening their refrigerator, eating their food, and then anonymous neighbor lady pops up with this gem. And she was always hungry, always wanting food. She's a sly fox because she could con you in, in just her way. And everybody dreaded it. She was scary. Natalia was always hungry. She always wanted food. That scary sly fox. The way she says it, like, she was always hungry. Like, it's, like, offensive to this woman. Like, how could this kid be hungry all the time? Could it be that Natalia was hungry and had no food in her apartment and no means to get food? And so she's just literally hungry and she's just trying to eat? (laughs) Oh my God, you horrible person. Now, at some point, Natalia did call the police. She claimed she was stalking one of her neighbors and she had thoughts of wanting to harm others. She was afraid of what might happen. People use this to be like, oh, see, she's a crazy psychopathic adult. Nope, that's not what's going on here. Apparently, Natalia also attempted to start a fire in her microwave, but this is alleged by Michael Barnett. I just, I have to believe and and ask myself, maybe if this was all a cry for help of some sort, right? To call the police and be like, hey, I'm stalking my neighbor. I'm afraid of what might happen. Send somebody. Just to get an adult there. Just to get some attention. Especially as the neighbor's patients wore thin and they started exerting their boundaries. Maybe Natalia just wanted the police to see her and they would be like, oh, what's happening here? Like, let's get you some help, little girl. Let's get you away from these barnets. She's looking for someone to help her. Now, Natalia told Sue McCallum and others that the reason she was not living with her parents, the Barnetts, was because they were afraid of her and because she had tried to kill them. And Toby Miles, in his usual show of bitch-assness, said, Natalia described standing over her parents with a knife, and they took all the knives away from her, and then she tried to poison her parents, so she had to sleep in the garage. And Toby's like, the way she just casually slid murder into the conversation like a serial killer, so disturbing. Once again, I'm trying to be understanding. I'm sure it was off-putting for Toby to hear Natalia say those things. But once again, and logically, this girl's not in prison. (laughs) So it's unlikely she did those things, right? I, I expect Natalia probably said these things casually because she was told to say them and she was told over and over again that she had done these things. She was probably also looking for a reason of why she'd been dumped into an apartment alone. And she must have thought like, well, I, I, I did these things. I must have done these things. Or else why would I be here? They have to be mad at me for something. I must have done something really bad. I also feel like there was probably a level of disassociation happening. And when somebody's disassociating, they'll say things in a very like deadpan, matter of fact, calm way. And I do feel like that was probably happening. Or she was saying these things because she was scared because she knew that if it once again got back to the Barnetts, that she was telling her neighbors a different narrative than she'd been instructed to, she'd be in trouble. She'd pay for it, right? We know that Natalia was telling some of her neighbors like, oh, I don't have food. I don't have toilet paper. I don't have clothes. And they called CPS. And then Heather Wilson told the Barnetts, this is what your daughter Natalia is telling the neighbors. And then the Barnetts are like, why are you telling people that? Don't tell people that. It's a lie. And now write a letter recanting everything. So at, after that, by that point, she's probably like, I just got to tell these neighbors what I'm instructed to tell them. I got to tell them what I've been told to tell them or else I'm going to get like in trouble again and Michael's going to be up in my apartment harassing me, torturing me and doing God knows what else to her that he didn't record. 
That's just, you know, me wondering if there was something else that happened when he wasn't recording. I'm sure there was. He didn't record the whole time he was there. So the neighbors talked about how Natalia spoke like an adult. She was a developing woman under her clothes, and it was clear that she was wearing a bra. And it's just, like, super weird, once again, that all these adults are talking about her like this. Like, there's a chance she's a child. You're still talking about her like this. She could have just been developing early. That doesn't mean anything. You guys aren't doctors. You're not experts. You don't know what you're talking about. So shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up about it. Like, I cannot believe these people are like, oh, yeah, I'm going to justify the way I treated her like an adult. And I'm going to tell you that all these things that I saw that made her look like an adult. And so I'm going to act like that's just, you know, all it takes. But really, in reality, none of these people knew anything about her condition. They don't know anything about her life. They didn't know anything about her development. So they were just making assumptions. And now they're trying to defend those assumptions to us. Well, indefensible. No defense for you. Okay? Case closed. Electric chair. The office manager of the apartment complex said about Natalia, quote, She would come into my office every day and get candy from the candy bowl and just sit and talk to me. And it was weird. I asked her specifically, How old are you? And she just shrugged her shoulders and said, I don't know. She may have been a child because that is something a child would do. Go into an office that, you know, has candy every day. Once you become friends with someone, you just walk into their house. I feel like a lot of the things she did were very childlike. End quote. She gets it. Exactly. What happens, like, if you have kids and you live in a neighborhood with lots of kids, what happens after you let one of those kids come over to your house and play with with your kid just once? All of a sudden, it's like they're family, man. They show up. They're walking in. Hey, hey, ma'am, I'm I'm here. I'm here to play with Aiden. Okay, hey, Robin or Joe or whatever the hell your name is. Come on in. Yeah, like you, you're you're already in. You came in. You know, they're kids. They don't have any idea of boundaries. They go into your fridge. They take your your Pepsi. They take your Gatorade. And it's like whatever. You don't get mad because it's like they're kids. They don't they don't understand things like boundaries. They feel at home here, and I want them to feel at home here. I want my kids' friends to feel at home here. This is something kids do. And, you know, there were also allegations that Natalia was inappropriate with other children in the area, especially the boys. She'd get too close to them, touch them. She made them uncomfortable. There were allegations that she'd been sexually inappropriate with adult men at the apartment complex. Once again, this may be true, but how is that her fault? (laughs) How is that her fault? She was a child who most likely, if these stories are true, had been sexually abused in the past. Sue McCallum said there was an older man who lived in the complex, and Natalia would always go to his apartment and spend hours in there with him, and she did this a lot. And it's sort of made out to be like, ugh, gross. What's Natalia doing with this man? Why is she always, like, going over there and using her seductive powers on this man? Like, what are they doing in there? As if Natalia is doing something wrong to this man. When I would ask the question, do you think that maybe once these neighbors turned into such judgmental assholes and started telling Natalia, like, you're not welcome here, don't come here anymore, Natalia had to take attention and company from anyone she could. And the man she found it with may have been a predator. She may have been molested in that man's apartment for several hours at a time. We don't know. We don't know who that dude is. He's, once again, not identified. We don't know what was happening in there. But she was a child left alone in an apartment complex at the mercy of any adult who might mean her harm. That's a problem. So Natalia remained at the apartment in Westfield for the duration of her lease. But the complex did not renew the lease at the end of the year for obvious reasons due to all of these jackasses complaining about Natalia instead of helping her. And so the Barnetts had to get Natalia a new apartment. But this time they chose a Lafayette, a not-so-nice part of town, because as Christine would later put it, Lafayette was a white trash town where no one would notice. Basically, no one would care to worry about Natalia or about what was going on with Natalia, not like the nosy neighbors in Westfield, because people in Lafayette were white trash, as Christine said, and they just didn't care. But in reality, Lafayette is actually going to be the place where Natalia meets the two people who end up saving her, Cynthia and Antoine Mans. They, like, take her in eventually after, you know, some time of of Natalia being there. But Natalia did stay at this apartment in Lafayette for a while by herself, and this apartment was not so nice. It was a two-story apartment. Natalia needed to climb a set of five stairs from the street to even get into the yard. She had to climb an additional set of six stairs from the yard to the door of the house, and then a 12-stair hallway inside, which would take her to the second-floor apartment that she lived in. The apartment was not modified for Natalia's condition at all. There weren't accommodations made for her disability to help her, like, climb on things or just to, you know, navigate this apartment safely. And when she was tucked away, 
the Barnetts didn't just go back to their fancy house. They packed up and left the country. And they moved to Canada. <laughs> so ludicrous. That is where we will pick up in the third and final part of this series. Thank you all so much for being here. Make sure that uh, you stay tuned for the third part where I'm going to give you more evidence. If you're not convinced yet, I'm going to give you more evidence. We're going to talk to Natalia's birth mother. We're also going to hear what happened after the Barnetts were arrested for neglect and how they ended up going to trial, but the justice system failed Natalia in every way, shape, or form. Like, the justice system has failed Natalia from her reaging process to the neglect trial. I really hope that something can be done. And I think the prosecution is still trying to figure out a way to nail Michael and Christine Barnett, nail them, um, like nail them to the wall and, and get them finally like to pay for what they did to Natalia. But we'll see if that will happen. But we're going to talk about all of that. We're going to wrap this up and uh, let me know what you think so far in the comment section. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't. Hit like if you liked the video. Share it if you think it's worth sharing. Stay kind, stay beautiful, and stay safe. And I'll see you very, very soon. Bye. Straight down And that river runs deep The mountains get steep And the voices getting too loud Oh, this feelings are very It's looking like a cemetery They're going back from the grave Calling out my name Better say a Hail Mary Well, you don't know How deep it goes Until it's getting you slowly It's all you got To let it go I got blood, blood on the strings